We are pain, that's all. We are God in our history. Yo guys! I'm Yurizi. Here's part 2 of what if Naruto studied Fuinjutsu. While exploring the Team 7 training ground, a young Naruto happens to stumble across a strangely shaped kunai embedded in a tree. Years of frustration and deciphering later, he finally cracks the Fuinjutsu formula hidden along the handle to surprising and painful results. At the same time, a ghost of the Atsutsuki sets in motion a plan to end his family's eternal conflict. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 7, The Test, Part 1. Naruto woke up as a nasty jolt of chakra burst through his system. He groaned and wanted to return to the sweet embrace of sleep, but he knew that he'd just receive a nastier jolt in another five minutes. Deciding it was time to get up, he lifted up his shirt and peeled the seal off of his chest. Another useful trick he had learned from his books. Shinobi had long ago realized it was much more cost-effective to design a new seal than keep wasting money on alarm clocks. Their instincts were so jumpy that they kept driving Kanai into their alarm clocks as they went off. He pulled himself out of bed and groggily meandered over to kitchen. He reached into his cabinet and started heating up a pot of water, before heading off towards the bathroom. As he let the shower warm up, he stared at his shirtless form in the mirror. After a minute of silence, he began focusing chakra and stared at the dark insignia that appeared over his stomach. So this was it. This was the source of every bad thing that had ever happened in his life. The source of all his pain, all his anguish, all his loneliness. Even as these bitter thoughts raced through his mind, his analytical side couldn't help but be amazed by the Yandame's work. The fourth really had been a genius. This wasn't just an efficient seal, this was art. Naruto could only recognize the double elephant seal, but he had no idea what the others meant. This was the step beyond the advanced class. A point that he only dreamed of reaching. He had initially held some resentment for the Yandame's actions, but he found that he couldn't stay mad at his idol. The man had to make the difficult decision and had apparently made the ultimate sacrifice in the process. If the fourth really thought he was up to the task, he was going to be sure to prove it to him. Besides, if those close to him saw him for who he truly was, what else really mattered? Newly invigorated, he tentatively entered the hot shower as a new train of thought re-entered his mind. It had been nagging at him all night. Who could have possibly delivered that thoughtful gift? He had already ruled out Nei-chan. It wasn't her style. She preferred to be loud, upfront and commanded your attention. Certainly wasn't Kitsune. While quiet, he would be frank and deliver anything in person, not hiding away in the dark. Besides, he had told him he would not give him another gift until he had mastered the previous gift from his last birthday. No one else came to mind as he dried himself off and headed towards his closet. He opened it and a sea of white and orange stared back at him. He had tried to shake things up with this awesome orange jumpsuit he had found a few months ago, but Kitsune had given it one look before slicing it in half, warning him to never wear it again. So he had stuck with his orange hoodies, until today that is. He reached into the back of the closet and pulled out the gift he had received from the previous night. As he stared at himself in the mirror, he felt something was missing. He snapped his fingers and raced over to his nightstand. He pulled his signature goggles over his neck and tightened his hitayite around his forehead, before returning to the mirror. There we go. He beamed as he admired his new look. Whoever had picked it out for him certainly had style. His eyes gazed over the clock and he was pleased to note he still had plenty of time. He strolled back into the kitchen, poured the hot water into his cup of ramen, and began his stroll out towards the academy. By this time, Hinata had already woken up and was getting dressed as well. She had just finished combing her hair, and was leaving her bathroom. As she opened the door, her gaze hardened as she stared holes through the tiny scroll sitting on her desk. The day after the incident in the library, she had woken up with the small scroll clenched firmly in her hands. She had no recollection of how she had acquired it, and when she asked her father about it, he claimed to have no knowledge of any scroll. The first time she opened it, she had felt the same feeling that the horned figure had given off in the room. Of course, she immediately wanted to be rid of it. However, no matter how many times she tried, the thing kept coming back in perfect condition. 
She had originally thrown it out of her window, only to find it later that night on her desk. Not one to give up, she had buried, burned, and ripped it apart, but it always kept reappearing fully intact later that day. It disturbed her to no end. It was like some cursed object she couldn't rid herself of. When she tried to show her father, his eyes seemed to fog up and he would act as if he had no idea what she was talking about. It was supernatural and she did not like it. What truly irritated her was whatever the scroll was trying to tell her, it was doing a poor job of it. No matter what she did, the scroll remained blank. She had tried to read it when she was alone, with the Byakugan, and even back in that accursed room. Every time, it remained as blank as the day she opened it. She shot it one last glare before picking up her kanai pouch and left the room. As she walked out, she bumped into the Hugas clan's little ball of fire. Good morning Mei Chan. While Hanabi was as serious as her father during spars, the moment she stepped out of the dojo, she was a bustling little firecracker of energy. So, she drawled, leaning in towards her sister, did you deliver your gift last night? Hinata's face flushed crimson as she nervously began tapping her fingers. I I I I don't know what you're talking about. Hanabi held her cocky smile, as she placed her hands on her hips. You can't lie to me Nei-chan. You may have told Ko you were just out training, but I saw what direction you were heading. Right towards Na. Hinata slapped her hand over Hanabi's mouth as her head whipped back and forth to make sure they were alone. Please don't talk about that here, she pleaded. The young girl rolled her eyes. Literally everyone knew about Hinata's crush. She didn't understand why the need to keep it so hush-hush. Apparently the only ones still oblivious to the fact were her father and the blonde boy in question. Got it Nichan, she said after Hinata removed her hand. Well, I just wanted to wish you good luck with your team assignments. She held her hand to her forehead in a mocking gesture. Who knows, maybe you will be paired off with that dashing Naruto Koen. It will be like a dream come true. Hinata shot her sister her patented side eye, clearly not amused by her joke. She still gave her a short hug before she made her way out of the house. Hanabi sighed as she watched her sister go. Her handler always tried to persuade her that she was the stronger of the two sisters, but she wouldn't hear any of it. She admired her sister's fierce determination, and, no matter what father said, Hinata was a stronger kunoichi than she would ever be. While she had been teasing, she really did hope that Hinata was placed on the same team as her crush. It would do her some good by forcing her into his presence, for everyone knew she would never make the first move herself. Shaking her head, she headed off towards the kitchen, hoping to sneak off with a cinnamon roll before she had her morning katas. Sasuke paused as he entered the mostly empty classroom to see the blonde boy dozing off in the front row. He just didn't know when to quit. Even after failing for the third time, he still had the gall to show up at the graduation ceremony. He passed him without a word as he claimed his seat in the second row next to the window. Over time, more and more of his classmates trickled in, each shooting the blonde the same confused look. Finally, Shikamaru arrived and paused in front of the blonde. He tapped his knuckles on top of the boy's head waking him up. Naruto, don't you think this is getting a little sad? This is for graduates only, not dropouts. Sure it was harsh, but it was time for the blonde to start facing reality. The boy yawned before erupting in a smile and tapping at his own hitayite. I know it's for graduates. That's why I'm here. Well what do you know? You actually did it. The pineapple-haired boy fought a smile from forming on his face. You know it, the blonde beamed. Shikamaru shook his head, noticing the blonde's new clothes, before muttering, troublesome, and walking up the stairs to take his seat next to Chuji. Hinata had blushed when she had seen the boy already dressed in the clothes she had left for him. She was happy to know that the blonde liked her gift. She had given him a grey long sleeve shirt and navy short sleeve hoodie along with two pairs of pants. One dark orange and one grey. She thought he looked quite handsome, and tried to stop a blush from creeping up her face. After several minutes Irika finally walked into the room and took his place in front of the class. I want you all to know just how proud I am of all of you. Your hard work has finally paid off and now you are all official shinobi of leaf. Now remember, the teams that each of you will be split up into will be like your family. More than likely, you will be working with these people for the rest of your life. However, the life of a ninja is never a certain one. Make sure to treasure every moment with your teammates, since you never know when they might be gone. He paused, as he made sure everyone let the message sink in. Sorry to end on that sour note you guys, but now let's move on to what you're all waiting for. 
Your team assignments. Everyone sat up as Irika began rattling off the names. An eerie quietness settled over the room, only broken by the whispers of the groups whose names had been called, that was until. Team 7, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto lifted his head at the sound of his name. Hinata Hyuga. A sharp intake of breath was heard from the back of the class. And Sasuke Achiha. In a flash, all of the girls in the room let out a loud groan as none of them were placed with their precious Sasuke Kun. They all shot glares at Hinata who eeped and tried to bury herself in her jacket. Now teammate, Sakura Haruno. She came out of her funk and paid him her direct attention. Kiba Inazuka the boy chuckled as the pink-haired girl let out a sigh. And Shino Aburain. The said boy merely adjusted his glasses. The pink-haired girl looked dejected and uncomfortable with her new teammates. Take that forehead girl. Ino thought triumphantly, before a wave of realization rolled over her. Wait, but that means. Irika cleared his throat before he continued. Team 10 will be as follows, Ino Yamanaka. Shikamaru Nara, and Chuji Akimichi. It was Ino's turn to look crestfallen as Sakura shot her a triumphant look, seeming much more pleased with her own teammates. These are all of the team assignments. All I can offer you now is the best of luck. I'm sure you will all make me proud so good luck in your career as a shinobi. He's late, the blonde whined as the second hour passed by. He tapped his foot vigorously and every once in a while stuck his head out into the hallway hoping for a glimpse of their sensei. Hinata and Sasuke sat at their desks and offered their silent agreements with the boys' complaints. At first Hinata had felt that she was on cloud nine. It had actually happened. She had another chance to make it up to him for the other day. Guilt still racked her mind, as she had once again been too scared and nervous to approach the boy in a time of need. She didn't know the full details how the blonde had finally been allowed to graduate, but she was now determined to make it up to him. Naruto Kuen. Please be patient. I'm certain there is a reason our sensei is late, Hinata said trying to defuse the situation. The blonde pouted and Sasuke ignored his next round of complaining. His thoughts were preoccupied by how the hell the dobe had done it. Sasuke was sure that Naruto had failed. He had seen him sitting dejectedly on the swing as he left the academy. So how he was here now, suddenly allowed to graduate. It made no sense to him. He supposed the Hokage finally needed a good ceiling expert, and just let the blonde pass just to get him into the system. He was brought out of his musing as Naruto grabbed an easer and chair. He wedged the eraser between the doorframe and the door, as he chuckled at his own ingenuity. Naruto Kuen. What are you doing? Hinata asked, moving from her desk for a better view. That's what he gets for being late, he replied triumphantly, moving the chair back to Irika's desk. At that moment, a certain spiky haired Jounin stood outside. He eyed the piece of chalk in the doorframe and shrugged before opening the door. Let them have some fun before he crushed their dreams. So the four of them found themselves sitting on the roof staring with anticipation at the silver haired Jounin who stared right back. He had asked them to name off their likes, disliked, and dreams for the future, while avoiding answering the same questions. He motioned Naruto to go first. He puffed out his chest before declaring, My name is Naruto Uzumaki. My likes are ramen, reading, creating new seals, my Gigi, Nechan, and Kitsunbaka too I guess. My dislikes are people who put down others and tardy teachers, eyeing Kakashi who simply shot him one of his eye smiles. My dreams are to one day become Kanoha's next seal master and the greatest Hokage of all time. Databeo. Kakashi only nodded as he turned his attention to the Hyuga heiress. Gomen. My name is Hinata Hyuga. My likes also include reading, as well as flower pressing, and my family. My dislikes. Her thoughts trailed off as she thought about the divide in amongst the Hyuga. Are rather personal to my clan. And my dreams are. She blushes as she shoots Naruto a quick glance, before holding her head high, to unify my clan and become the next clan leader. Kakashi gave her a nod, before turning to the last member of the team. Sasuke curtly replied, I don't really have a lot of things I like, but plenty of things I dislike. I don't really have a dream, but rather a goal. I am going to restore my clan, and kill a certain man. Naruto and Hinata felt uncomfortable as the atmosphere had taken a much more somber tone. Kakashi seized the opportunity to explain to them the survival exercise they'd be having. No matter how many genin teams he had failed over the years, he never got over the hilarity of their shocked expressions. The next day. 
Kakashi felt as if he was looking into a mirror of the past as he watched his latest team interact. Like he himself had done, Sasuke was leaning against the bridge ignoring all attempts at communication from the other two. Hinata was quiet and calm, just as Rin had been, and acted as the mediator between the two boys, although it was painfully obvious that she favored the blonde. Naruto was talking a mile a minute, while Hinata tried her best not to faint from the boys' close proximity. It was like seeing two people in one as Naruto painfully reminded him of both his late sensei and Uchiha teammate. He even had goggles just as Abito had. Kakashi sighed. He'd probably have to pass this team too. The backlash from the civilian council and Hyuga clan would be a pain in the ass if he were to fail the Uchiha and Hyuga heirs. He also felt that he had an obligation to his sensei to ensure that his son received proper training. However, he had his own code, and he was going to stick to it. If these students weren't able to determine the true meaning of the test, he would fail all of them. Perhaps he would take Naruto under his wing, but he would probably have to fight Kitsune over him. But he was getting ahead of himself. He reached into his back pocket and pulled out his trademark orange book and leaned back against the tree he was hiding in. Wouldn't want to make them think that he could actually arrive on time. The breeze whipped through the training grounds causing Naruto to stop and sniff at the air. He scowled as he started scanning the tree line. Hinata noticed this and asked, What is it Naruto-kun? He shook his head as he said, I could have sworn I just smelled Kakashi-sensei, but I don't see him anywhere. He was surprised when he saw veins starting to bulge around Hinata's eyes as she scanned around the field. She stopped and turned toward the direction Naruto had previously pointed to. He's over there sitting in that tree. What is he doing? Sasuke piped in, curious what could possibly holding up their sensei. He seems to just be sitting and reading, she replied. A tick mark formed on Naruto's head as he screamed, Hey you Baka sensei. Stop wasting our time reading your stupid books. A second late the spiky haired appeared in a swirl of leaves saying, Yo. You're late. Naruto's scream echoed across the training ground. Nope. I've been here the whole time waiting for you to find me and I got to say I'm a little disappointed. Even Sasuke sat up at this comment. You never said anything about finding you, Naruto balked. True, but you all haven't utilized any of this free time to do anything productive. All this time and you guys have just wasted it waiting around. Did it not occur to you to stretch or warm up before I got here? Maybe make some plans for the test? Even Sasuke looked away as the thought had not occurred to any of them. Kakashi sighed as he motioned for them to follow. As he reached a set of training posts, he reached into his bag and pulled out an alarm clock. It was time for the bell test to commence. A shinobi must be able to conceal their movements and hide efficiently. This lesson was engraved into every student in the academy. That class was covered more thoroughly than any of the other practical classes, such as throwing kanai and shuriken. The class had a midterm assignment of sneaking from one side of Kanoha to the other without being spotted by the planted shinobi hiding among the civilians. Many students were eventually caught due to being careless or reckless. But not Sasuke and Hinata. Kakashi could still sense their chakra, but he couldn't see them at all. The fruits of their efforts were evident. Naruto, however, had decided to ignore that class apparently. The blonde boy appeared in a blur in front of Kakashi. The boy reminded him so much of his sensei, especially in that outfit. You know, compared to the others, you're not very bright. Why bother hiding? You're a jounin. No matter how well we conceal ourselves, you'd be able to find us no sweat. Now, now. You might be overestimating my capabilities a little much don't you think? The blonde vigorously shook his head. Nope, Kitsune-san can find me anywhere, even when he's not trying. Even if you say you're a jounin, I'm certain you're tracking skills up to par with him. Inu, the blonde finished with a mischievous grin. If Kakashi was surprised, he didn't show it. The blonde continued, by the way, I wanted to thank you for stopping those villagers six years ago. It meant a lot to me. Kakashi waved him off. Think nothing of it. It was the least I could do. Now, if you are finished moping about in the past. He began reaching into his pouch putting Naruto immediately at alert. Shinobi Battle Tactics, Part 1, Kakashi said, sounding like a textbook. Taijutsu, the physical part. Taijutsu. Then why is he reaching for his pouch? Naruto wondered as he prepared to snatch a kunai to defend himself. He was caught off foot as his sensei pulled out a familiar orange book. What are you? Naruto asked confused. You can start whenever you feel like it, the jounin said as he flipped a page. 
Why, why are you reading that perverted book? Why? The silver-haired man asked. To find out what happens in the story obviously. Don't worry, I'm sure your weak attacks won't be enough to actually harm me. Steam blowing out of his ears, the blonde rushed at the older man throwing out a punch with as much strength as he could muster. He was bothered when the man caught it without even looking. The boy landed and threw a quick kick, which was just as easily blocked. The boy began a flurry of kicks and punches all of which were effortlessly stopped by the older man. He's fast, Kakashi noted to himself, but extremely sloppy. He had heard negative things from the academy, but this was ridiculous. It was like the boy was incorporating different moves from a multitude of styles that meshed together in an unholy mess. He delivered a powerful kick to the blonde boy's gut, which sent him skidding back several feet. The boy rose to his feet and angrily formed his hands together and the tiger seal and ten shadow clones puffed into existence beside him. Many dipped into their pouches drawing kunai and charged as one. Kakashi barely moved an inch as he dismantled every clone that attempted to get near him. As he blocked one kick, he noted the original standing in the back watching the events unfold. So the loud brat actually knew how to use his head. He brought his thoughts to a close as he dismembered the last of the clones. He closed his book and the two seemed to just stare at each other. After a minute, the blonde brought his hands in another seal, summoning more clones. Kakashi was a little disappointed. He had been told that the blonde was quite imaginative. You can't just beat me with clones. At this rate, you'll never get a bell. The blonde chose to ignore the man's taunt and reached into his bag. Quickly, he threw down a smoke grenade, engulfing the area in purple smoke. Kakashi stayed put as he heard the clones beginning to surround him. He was about to reach for some shuriken to dispel them, when a pair of hands shot out of the ground and clasped onto his feet. Immediately, the clones charged as one. Using his superior strength, Kakashi wrenched himself free of the hand underground and jumped into the air, hearing the satisfying pops of the clones after he let loose his barrage of shuriken. As he soared out of the cloud of gas, he saw the original Naruto going through several hand seals. Even without his Sharingan, he recognized that Jutsu and actually began to worry. What was Kitsune doing teaching that Jutsu to an academy student? Naruto brought a hand to his lips as he exclaimed, Katon, Fox Hellfire. A stream of spiking, yellow fire streaked from mouth. It surged forward and engulfed Kakashi's body, setting him ablaze instantly. Cutting off the Jutsu, Naruto found a burning log in the place of his sensei. Kyuso. Kakashi watched the boy from the tree lean as he desperately tried to find his teacher. At least Kitsune had been smart enough to make sure the blonde mastered the jutsu in parts. It may function as a simple katan jutsu in its base form, but its second or third level were no laughing matter. As the boy let out another curse, Kakashi smiled under his mask. So the prankster has a temper problem? This thought brought a smirk to his face as an idea popped into his head. He quickly set up a double-layered snare trap using a bell as the bait. The sunlight reflected off the bell caused the boy to stop. He immediately lit up and ran towards the bell only to stop a foot away. Kakashi frowned as the boy hesitated. Then he placed his foot a few inches away from its previous path and scooped up the bell. Nice try sensei, but you have to wake up real early to trick the number one prankster in Kanoha. Kakashi dropped from the tree and studied the blonde. Once again, the boy was proving that as brash as he usually was, he could think outside the box and think clearly when he needed to. But he couldn't just let the blonde pass due to his own error. Very good Naruto, I'll certainly remember that next time. Alright, well I just keep this then. The blonde closed his eyes as he smiled. This instant was all the Jounin needed. Keep what? Kakashi asked curiously. The bell of Kur, the blonde was shocked to find nothing in his hand. He began frantically checking the ground. Oh, do you mean this bell? Kakashi asked as he held up the lost item. What? How? When did you, give that back? I think I'll pass. You have to take the bell from me, not pick it up off the ground. Anger etched itself across his face, as he yelled, fine then. Time to pull out all the stops. He clasped his hands together and more clones burst into existence. Kakashi sighed, but the boy formed another hand sign and something was immediately wrong. The ground beneath his feet collapsed into a crater and he was finding it incredibly difficult to move his body. A gravity seal. When did he? Of course, when the clone burst out of ground to hold me in place. He already had a plan ready in case that one failed. 
The group of blondes jumped on top of him and pinned him down as the original whipped out a handful of kanai and flung them at the heap of bodies. Kakashi wasn't a jounin for nothing. Even under the influence of the gravity seal, he was still able to use his incredible strength to wrench one of the blondes off him and fling him into the path of most of the kanai coming towards him. He twisted his way out of the paths of the remaining kanai, ensuring that the clones attached to him would fall in their line of fire. Something vaguely familiar passed by his head, as he turns his attention to the original and everything seemed to stop. He watched awestruck as the blonde disappeared in a flash of yellow light that he had seen a hundred times. He felt the presence behind and turned to meet a painful punch to his jaw. The blonde reared back for another blow, but bent over clutching his stomach. If he had eaten earlier, any and all contents of his stomach would have been vacated. Instead, he proceeded throw up an unhealthy amount of blood. Still awestruck, Kakashi ripped off the seal with a mild katan pilot jutsu as he rubbed his jaw. That had actually hurt. More importantly, the blonde was more and more reminding him of the ghost of his past. That had been the Hiration no jutsu, no doubt about it. He really was the budding fuinjutsu prodigy the Hokage had boasted him to be. Naruto squatted hugging his stomach as he tried to orient himself. I feel awful. You're about to feel a lot worse, a chilling voice said behind him. Naruto could barely register the words before a blinding pain erupted from his ass as Kakashi shouted, Kanoha secret finger jutsu, 1000 years of death. The boy was sent skyrocketing into the air heading deep into the woods before a satisfying thud was heard from the clearing. Kakashi barely had time to think as a shuriken whipped past his face. This team was just full of surprises. It was time to see if Sasuke's performance could live up to Naruto's stellar showing. Chapter 8, The Test, Part 2 Hinata raced through the woods heading towards where Naruto had impacted. She had found him easily enough with her Byakugan, but Kakashi-sensei had really sent him flying. It took her at least seven minutes to reach Naruto's location, and she didn't like what she saw when she arrived. Naruto had apparently crashed headfirst through a thick branch and was now passed out on the forest floor. On his way down, the branches had torn up his face and now it was covered in some nasty scratches. She turned him over and carefully dragged him so that he was leaning against a tree. She didn't know what caused him to vomit so intensively after that technique, but she didn't want him choking if he had a repeat episode. She reached into her pouch and took out her special ointment that she had made herself and started working on fixing his cuts. As she worked on the blonde, dabbing the cream on his scratches, Kakashi could not help but be impressed. He stalked the pair from the treetops as his clone finished up with Sasuke. He couldn't help but be surprised by her medical knowledge. He was pleased to note that all traces of her shyness seemed to evaporate as she worked. She reminded him of a doctor working in an operating room. No emotions clouding your judgment and just focusing on your goal. Time to see if those Hyuga eyes were as good at detecting genjutsu as the clan claimed. Kakashi began to cast a light genjutsu with the intention of making it seem like Naruto's state was deteriorating, but the moment the jutsu started to seep into her system, she whipped around and noticed him immediately. Even without the Byakugan active, she still saw right through his genjutsu. He cut the jutsu short and just stared back at the girl. Now that took some serious chakra control and mental discipline. He was actually starting to like this girl. He dropped to the ground in front of them as Hinata took up a defensive stance over Naruto. That's some very efficient cream. Those scratches already look like they're healing. Any chance you're willing to tell me where you got it? I made it myself from herbs found within the Hyuga estate. Kakashi noted how her stance did not waver, despite her cordial tone. Really? Very impressive. Now then, what are you going to do? There isn't much time left, and you're the only one who hasn't attempted to obtain the bells. She bit her lip as she glanced between the Jounin and the boy behind her. There was no way she was going to be able to protect him as well as try to get the bells. She was no fool. She knew she had no chance by herself. She needed help. She quickly flung a kanai at Kakashi before slamming a smoke grenade into the ground. He didn't even move his feet as he batted the kanai away, keeping his eye on the smoke. After the clouds settled, he wasn't too surprised that Hinata and Naruto were gone. At least she understood the point of the exercise, Kakashi thought to himself, but that isn't enough. All three of them have to work together if they want to succeed. Hinata raced toward Sasuke's chakra with Naruto's limp form on her back. With Naruto out cold she was going to need the Uchiha's help if any of them were going to pass. As she entered the clearing, she was startled to find Sasuke's head sticking out of the ground. 
He shot her a glare as a blush erupted across his cheeks. Not. F word, he muttered, clearly embarrassed by his helpless situation. She gave him a nod, and carefully set Naruto, before helping him dig himself out. Around this time, Naruto was finally beginning to stir, and when he did, he was met with a massive headache. Ugh, what hit me? He said as he tried to regain his bearings. His eyes were blurry and he blinked a few times before his vision finally came back into focus on the sight of Sasuke's head. He took one look, before bursting out laughing and falling on his back. Sasuke's face burned crimson in anger and embarrassment. Shut up, dumbass. Oh my lord. This is priceless. The blonde rolled on the ground clutching his sides, as Sasuke finally climbed free from his trap. He gave Hinata a thankful nod as he began brushing off his clothes. Em, excuse me you too. Hinata interjected. She felt her face heating up as both boys turned their attention onto her. Why had this been so much easier a minute ago? I don't think any of us are going to be able to get a bell from Kakashi-sensei on our own. Speak for yourself, the Uchiha cut in, I'm going off to find that man and take that bell. Hey, Naruto yelled grabbing the retreating boy's shoulder forcing him to face him. That was rude. Apologize to Hinata-chan. Let go of me. I don't want either of your help, nor do I need it. You can't do everything yourself you jackass. Stop being so stubborn and just hear her out. And I just said I don't want your help. Why you little? Their argument was broken off as the sound of the alarm clock pierced across the training grounds. Time was up. Oh, Hinata. A familiar voice called sweetly from a tree near the training posts. Looking up, the genin saw their sensei lazily leaning against the tree trunk. Yes sensei, she muttered nervously. She did not like where this was going. Did you try to get a bell? He asked far too casually. Hinata took a step back. And no sensei. Well, you know what that means right? Hinata could only hang her head in shame as she accepted her fate. Kakashi had been more than a little disappointed by the results. There was no denying that these kids were talented. Skill-wise they earned their genin ranking with flying colors, and maybe could even put a few chun into shame. As he went over the concept of the survival exercise, he could not help but notice the feelings of guilt that spread across the boys' faces. If they had tried together to get the bells, he was certain that they at least be able to get one of them. Alright, I'm going to give you guys one last chance. He left clear instructions to not feed Hinata for her failure to even attempt to obtain a bell, before disappearing with a shunshin. He now watched the pair eating quietly as the young girl's stomach growled, causing her to turn red in embarrassment. As if planned together, both boys offered their lunches at once. The three genin stared at each other in shock before Hinata shook her head. Please do not waste your opportunity on me. Too bad Hinata-chan. I have to make it up to you for patching me up after I landed on my head. I also owe you an apology, Sasuke said as he offered her his food, you were the only one who saw the true meaning of this test. With all of us at our full strength, I'm confident we can get the bells from Kakashi. The blonde vigorously nodded his head in agreement, as tears threatened to fall down the young girl's face. Kakashi smiled behind his mask. They finally got it. Come on sensei. Let us go. Naruto yelled as he struggled against the rope. Sorry. You and Sasuke admitted yourselves that Hinata was the only one who saw through the true meaning of the test. Meaning that you two are the ones who failed. If you want to get free, do it yourself. The blonde and black-haired boys were now tied up against the training posts as Hinata and Kakashi stood over them. All right then, we'll meet back here tomorrow for our first real day of training. As he turned to leave, he gave one last look to Hinata. I know I just gave that whole speech about abandoning comrades, but try to overlook that right now. Don't help them get free. They'll never learn if you keep picking up the slack. She blushed at the compliment, as the jounin disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Hinata turned and bowed to the two boys, with a light smile on her face. Gomen, Naruto kun, Sasuke kun. But it appears I am less than trash. With that she turned and left, barely controlling her giggling. Hinata chan. Please. Don't leave us. It was another grueling 15 minutes before Sasuke finally freed himself from his bindings. Great job, Sasuke team. Now let me out. The blonde pleaded. Sasuke smirked and dropped his kunai just out of reach of Naruto's feet. A good shinobi should be able to escape from this himself. He strolled away as the blonde yelled at him with a plethora of curses. 
After a painstaking hour, Naruto was finally able to wriggle a kunai out of his pouch and cut himself free. Yada! He shouted to the air. He was about to head home, when he remembered he was about to forget something. He froze at the realization and frantically started searching the field wondering where he could have dropped it. Panic was starting to overtake him when a cool voice behind him called out, looking for this? He spun around to find Kakashi dangling his special kunai from his finger. Naruto couldn't help but let out a sigh of relief. Thank you Kakashi-sensei. I don't know what I would have done if I lost that. He reached out for it, but was surprised when Kakashi pulled it away. I'm happy to return this back to you, but I have a couple of questions I'd like answered first, Kakashi said in a more serious tone. After he was sure the blonde understood, he continued, first off, let's start with the easier question. I assume Kitsune was the one who taught you that katanjutsu. The boy was quiet as he nodded vigorously, anxious to get his kanai back. I want to make sure that he fully explained how dangerous that jutsu can be. As Naruto tilted his head to the side, it was evident the blonde didn't know what he was talking about. I'm sure Kitsune has told you there are multiple steps to that jutsu, correct? Another nod. Good, I'm sure that he was going to fully explain it to you, but you are now my soldier, and I want to make sure you know how dangerous that jutsu can be. He brought up his other hand and raised one finger. That technique is Kitsune's signature jutsu, as well as one of his most deadly. The jutsu has three stages, each more dangerous than the last. The first is the one you have down, which acts almost like a simple flamethrower katan jutsu. It supplies a steady stream of fire, which takes on yellow hue. What makes this jutsu special is that the flames linger as long as the caster is conscious. Only he can dispel the flames. He raised his second finger as he continued, the next stage is about increasing the heat and intensity of the jutsu. The jutsu changes from crimson to a pure white as the heat in increased dramatically. At this stage, the flames would be hot enough to melt steel. What makes it special is like the previous stage, they keep their intense heat even after the technique is ended. The flames only disappear when the caster wants them to. The boy seemed excited as he lifted his third finger. Finally, the third stage, which is the most deadly of them all. This stage is why I am making sure you understand how dangerous that jutsu can be. The heat is turned up even more at this stage, turning the flames solid blue. What is incredibly deadly is what happens when the flames come in contact with something. While the first stage is about forming the shape and the second is about increasing the intensity, the third step is about changing the composition of the jutsu. I don't know the full details, but I do know that anything the flame touches practically liquefies on contact. The boy's eyes were wide in excitement at this. This can go for anything. Steel walls, masonry. He shot him a glare with his visible eye. People. The boy gulped as the realization hit him. He had used a jutsu that could do that on Kakashi-sensei. Thankfully, I am a jounin and that was only the first level of the technique, but imagine if you had tried to use that on someone who wasn't able to evade in time. Even if you were using the lower level of the jutsu, imagine hitting one of your teammates. You'd be panicking, making it harder for you correctly form your chakra to dispel the jutsu. He didn't have to say it, but he could tell the boy got the message, be careful and don't use it in a spar against his teammates. Now, moving on. The more prevalent question on my mind is this. Once again he held up the kunai. Where did you find this? Naruto gulped as he answered, I found it out in the woods around here a couple years ago. I saw the seal formula and I just couldn't help myself. I've been working on it ever since. Kakashi could not hide his shock. Are you saying that you learned the Hiration all by yourself? The boy ate up the man's surprise. He puffed out his chest and said you bet your ass I did. Although, there are still those drawbacks, he thought to himself with a wince. Kakashi was silent for a moment. Well, isn't that something else? Finally, he tossed the kunai back to the boy, who felt relief flood through his body as his prized possession came back to where it belonged. His relief quickly turned to shock as he watched Kakashi reach into his own pouch and pulled out an identical kunai to the one in his hands. The boy's head swiveled back and forth between the two as if he couldn't comprehend what he was seeing. Where, where did you get that? Naruto asked with a hint of awe, while his head began to overflow with questions. Were you the one to develop the jutsu? Kakashi laughed as he shook his head. Sorry to burst your bubble, but no. My own sensei was actually the one who developed the jutsu. He gave me this kanai as a gift the day I became jounin. 
I've always kept it with me as a reminder of him. Rubbing the handle one last time, he made up his mind as he offered it to the boy. Take it. It seems like it will do more good with you than with me. Kakashi said chuckling at Naruto's starstruck expression. Naruto couldn't stop himself from shaking as he slowly took the blade from the older man's hand. R, are you sure sensei? His voice cracked. He couldn't help but run his fingers along the handle, feeling the grooves of the symbols etched into the wood. Kakashi shrugged. It seems to me that you'll get more out of it than I ever have. Naruto was silent before lunging at the jounin and wrapping around him in a tight embrace. Kakashi was surprised but chuckled as he patted the blonde's hair. Thank you, the blonde whispered, almost muffled by the jounin's flak jacket. Don't mention it. Now, while I'm certainly impressed with how far you've gotten by yourself. I know from first-hand experience that those side effects aren't normal. The blonde slowly removed himself and seemed embarrassed as he wiped his nose before answering. I'm trying to figure that out. The problem is that the effects vary in intensity each time I do it. I tested to see if distance or chakra usage made the reaction worse, but it has never been constant. Kakashi nodded as he began to turn back towards the village. He had a meeting after all. Wait Kakashi-sensei. The boy pleaded. I have to know. Who was your sensei? Is he someone I'd know? Kakashi chuckled as he glanced back over his shoulder. You might have heard of him. After all, he was the one that placed that seal on your stomach. Kakashi stayed long enough to enjoy the look of wide-eyed realization flash across the boy's face, before he shunshined away towards the Hokage's office. Two hours later. This is just getting silly. I don't understand why you allow him to get away with this Hokage-sama, an irate Karinai said as she and Asuma stood before the Sandane. Let's just say he's paying his respects to someone in his own special way, the Hokage replied coyly. What do you, Kurinai was cut off as a knock at the door signaled that he had finally arrived. Well, look who it is, Asuma said rolling his eyes as Kakashi sauntered in, couldn't you have hurried up to tell us that you failed them? You know we can't leave until everyone's reports are in. Kakashi barely paid him any mind as he stood before the professor. I'm happy to report that Team 7 passed with flying colors. Silence settled over the room. Kakashi couldn't help but be amused at the sight of Asuma's cigarette just barely hanging out of his mouth. Did they now? The Hokage asked with a knowing smile, folding his hands in front of his face. What can I say? The kids have talent, Kakashi replied with a shrug, before turning his full attention to the Hokage. I need to speak to you alone. Now, ignoring the others in the room, he followed up with, without ANBU. Kurinii couldn't help but shoot him a worried look but obediently turned and left the room after a nod from the Hokage. She and Asuma shot the pair one final glance as they followed the ANBU agents out the door, which shut behind them with soft thud. After a moment of silence, Kakashi turned to his right and said, You too, Kitsun. The boy appeared behind the old man's shoulder, his body tense and protective. The Hokage spared him a glance and a knowing look. Reluctantly, the boy stood down and offered one last bow before following the others out of the room. The silence that settled over the room was deafening. It was another minute before Kakashi spoke up again. So, when were you going to tell me we had another yellow flash on our hands? The old man chuckled as he palmed his pipe and produced a small flame from his finger to light it. I thought it would be entertaining to see your blind reaction. He paused and took a drag of his pipe before continuing. I'm honestly surprised he got a punch in. Kakashi eyed the glass ball behind the old man's desk as he rubbed his jaw. I was surprised myself. Though he only landed it because of the shock value and the gravity seal. So, he really did discover it himself, the old man nodded leaning back in his chair. I was just as surprised as you. It was about two years ago. I had known for a while he had been meddling with some secret project for some time, but when he came forward and showed me what it was, I was speechless. It was like watching Minato attempt the technique all over again. He softly smiled as a wave of nostalgia settled over him. He let the feelings reminisce for a few moments longer, before his expression took on a more serious look, however, I am concerned about the toll the jutsu is taking on his body. Kakashi nodded as the Hokage took another drag of his pipe. Minato had experienced some disorientation during the early stages of development, but afterwards his body adjusted to the feeling. The only time he experienced anything similar to what Naruto has felt was the first time he ever attempted it. That was before he adjusted the night aim's seal. If Tsunade hadn't been present, he was silent as the implication rolled over both of them. 
The Hokage rose from his chair with a groan and turned to look out of the glass window over the village. What do you think the issue could be? Kakashi asked as he walked around the desk and stood next to the older man. Who knows? We are talking about a situation where a child, a talented child granted, but nevertheless a child, is attempting to recreate an extremely difficult technique that has stumped seal masters for years. It could be anything from the boy simply not performing the jutsu correctly to something in the seal fighting against him. Since he's come this far, why not let him look over the jutsu source formula? The thought had crossed my mind, but we were never able to locate a detailed copy of Minato's version of the formula. To be honest, it is likely still locked away in the Namike's estate. The place is blocked off by powerful blood seals, and Jiraiya refuses to help do anything about them. Leaving the only way in to be. Naruto, Kakashi finished. Correct, and that would raise some difficult questions that the boy is not ready for. It is far too early. Besides, he has come this far on his own. Let's see if the boy is able to master it by himself. The more he experiments, the better understanding he will gain from it. The Hokage side then turned his gaze towards the west side of the village. Now I think we've discussed Naruto enough for one night. I'm curious to hear about your other two students as well. Kakashi closed his visible eye. Sasuke performed just as you'd expect from the Uchiha. Powerful fire techniques and superb taijutsu skills. I'd be willing to say that he is already chunin rank and skill, but, but? The Hokage asked with a raised eyebrow. But, he needs to work on social skills. I can already see traces of a severe inferiority and superiority complex in the works. At least he sees his teammates as people he can stand. I intend to keep a close eye on that and make sure it doesn't develop into something ugly. The Hokage nodded. And what about little Hinata? Kakashi rubbed his head. Honestly, I didn't get a good look at Hinata's skill level. I can only assume that she is competent in her clan's taijutsu. She was the only one who saw through the meaning of the test and was preoccupied with aiding her teammates the entire time. I'd appreciate it if you could point me in the direction of some beginner medical jutsu. She has a knack for it. Coupled with her Byakugan, I see quite the surgeon in our future. The Hokage nodded as he soaked this in. She may end up needing more of your attention than the boys will. She's got a lot of trouble already piled at her feet. Kakashi warily stared at the old man. As her teacher, you are entitled to certain information. This is a secret to be kept between Hayashi Hyuga and us. About two years ago, there was an incident beneath the clan's library. Said Hyuga unceremoniously flopped onto her bed, exhausted from the day's events. She had just finished talking with her father. His eyes had flashed when he heard the names of her teammates, and she could have sworn she had seen him sharply glance to a photo on his desk. Even after that display, he seemed pleased with the results of her report. Of course, she had left out the part of how she had been tied to the pole. She could only imagine the lecture and shame she would receive if he heard about that. She shifted her head into a more comfortable position, and was met by the small scroll sitting on her nightstand. She glared at the parchment until she noticed that something was different. Just like it's inside, the outside had always remained blank, but now, there was a kanji for one written in black ink. She nervously took the scroll into her hand. She took a deep breath before slowly opening it. The once blank pages were now partly filled. She gazed across the title that read, The Tale of the Rabbit Goddess, Part 1. Chapter 9, A Change of Pace One month later, Sasuke was irritated. Granted, this wasn't an unusual thing for him, but today it was at a boiling point. He had hoped that after leaving the academy his training would finally start getting serious. Instead, he felt like he was stuck in place, doing nothing to affect his growth. For the past month, all his sensei had taught them was team-building exercises. He didn't need or want the man's sentimental lessons. This plus the fact that they were stuck doing chores every day was driving him mad. He refused to call them missions. No matter how much Kakashi explained how the D-ranks were essential for the village and a rite of passage for Genin, it was still a waste of their time. What bothered him even more was the feeling that he was no longer miles ahead of his teammates. He shot the two a glance. The three of them had settled into this morning routine as they waited for their sensei to eventually show up. Hinata was off to the side warming up with her Jukin Katas, while blonde loudmouth sat across from him with his nose stuck behind another one of his books. Even though he held no interest in studying Fuinjutsu, 
Sasuke couldn't help but feel frustration creep through his body over the boy's proficiency in the art, especially after the blonde's latest news. After years of effort, Naruto had finally arrived at the final book of the intermediate series. During their missions, he wouldn't stop talking about how excited he was for some sort of test. Apparently, if he passed it, he could finally move on to the advanced series. Although he could have been more humble about it, Sasuke had indeed earned the right to consider himself the strongest of his age group. That being said, even he wouldn't claim to be any kind of expert in the fields he specialized in. His levels in taijutsu and ninjutsu were certainly above most chunin, but still nowhere close to earning a title of mastery. It was humbling and vexing to admit that he wasn't the only prodigy on the team. The boy may have been socially inept and struggled with the simplest of subjects, but somehow he was at a level of skill that already surpassed the majority of fuinjutsu users in Kanoha. Not that there were many fuinjutsu users in Kanoha, mind you. For how important the art seemed to be, he was surprised when he had found out that they were extremely uncommon. When trying to consider why, he recalled what his mother had once told him about a failed ceiling core project. It had been a project created by the Yandame as an attempt to revitalize the dying art back to Kanoha. In fact, a close friend of Sasuke's mother had apparently been some sort of teacher for this project. However, the project fell apart after the Kyubi attack and the Yandame's death. Without teachers, the students apparently struggled to progress any further after they approached the more complicated course load. Yet, here sat the class clown advancing further than grown adults had managed even with help from a Hokage. Sasuke tried to shove the accomplishments of the irritating blonde out of his mind as his gaze fell upon his other teammate. Even she was progressing, although not exactly in her skills as a ninja. She had finally become more comfortable around the two boys and her stutter had all but disappeared. Of course, she still blushed up a storm whenever Naruto complimented her or got too close. Today, as he watched her go through her sets, he started to notice something was wrong. It was like her body was on autopilot as it moved from set to set. It just seemed too stiff. As he gazed at her face, he could tell that something was bothering her. Hinata's mind was indeed occupied. Her thoughts lingered on the conversation she had before she arrived at the training grounds, earlier that morning. Hinata had made it abundantly clear she held no fondness for the bottom floor of the clan library. In fact, the only positive memory she could associate with the place was of the jutsu scroll her mother had left her. She hated the dark, cold feeling the room gave off, which seemed to mirror the main family that were its only visitors. That being said, she couldn't deny that the room was an incredible source of information. It was just that none of it was helping her right now. The previously dark room was now brightly lit as new lanterns had been placed along the walls. Hinata sat at a desk in the corner of the room consumed by a sea of scrolls. Ever since that day when the scroll finally decided to reveal its contents, she had immersed herself in research. She had realized that this was something that was never going to go away until she dealt with it. So, she decided to take the initiative. Her father had given her full access to the clan's records and she was making the most of it. She usually never worked on her project in the mornings. Normally, she reserved time for the scroll only after her daily missions and her own private training. Today, she had decided to come down to the floor because she believed she might have stumbled upon a breakthrough the night before. However, just as the others before it, her lead turned out to be another dead end. While her lead had initially held promise, records from multiple sources just didn't line up with the story in the scroll. She rubbed her eyes and looked at her clock. She decided she could read through it one more time before she had to meet up with her teammates. She picked up the scroll and began reading the fable she almost had memorized by this point. The Tale of the Rabbit Goddess, Part 1 It is believed that power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is the tale of the Rabbit Goddess. How she came to be, came to love, came to fear, and came to hate. For love breeds sacrifice, which in turn breeds hatred. When we lose someone or something precious to us, hate is born. Vengeance is the product of that hate and so death and pain follow. For millennia, pain spread across the world of man, bringing with it the ultimate byproduct of human nature, war. Wars for greed. Wars for love. Wars amongst enemies. Wars amongst friends. Wars amongst rivals. Wars amongst brothers. It was a never-ending cycle that consumed the human consciousness. Then one day, a being clad in blinding light descended from the sky. Her skin was as white as ivory. Her eyes were as pale as the moon. This celestial maiden was revered and taken into the world of man. She was taken in and served the lord of the land she arrived in. 
This Lord and the maiden made a connection during her service. However, this was not love. Love was a foreign concept to her. She had only one desire in this world. Her wish was for a world of peace devoid of fighting. Over time, rival nations grew jealous of the Lord and his mysterious mistress, and decided to lay claim to the land. However, a great spirit inhabited this land. In the center of the mountains stood the divine tree, whose branches towered above all. From this tree, a single fruit was born. This fruit was said to contain great power, but the tree spirit would defend its power from any intruders. To end the fighting in her name, the maiden stormed the stronghold of the spirit and took the power of the fruit for her own. From the moment the fruit entered her mouth, their destinies were entwined. From that point forward, one could not exist without the other. Their energies merged, and with her newfound power, she laid waste to the armies of man. Thus began the reign of the Byakugan queen, who was praised for her power and became a goddess to the people of the world. To maintain this power, she cut all her ties to the land she had previously known. This included her ties to the lord with whom she had connected. Over time, the fruits of their connection emerged and the rabbit goddess gave birth to two sons. These sons were also blessed with the power of the tree, and she finally learned to love. However, the seeds of mistrust had already been planted. The story abruptly cut off at this point, and it irritated her to no end. Hinata was someone who could not stand to leave a book unfinished. She felt that she had only been given a glimpse into this story and she wanted to know more. Who was this woman? How did she fall from grace? Hinata had never heard of such a title of a Byakugan queen. She had combed through the piles of scrolls of the clan's history looking for any hint towards the story. This morning, she had been following a lead of a Huga matriarch who had used a similar moniker, however, her origins were well documented and did not align with the story. Hinata didn't know what to make of this whole thing. This absurd situation of ghosts, goddesses, and divine figures made her feel uncomfortable. While she wanted to dismiss the story as a fairy tale, she had the sinking suspicion that it was more than a precautionary tale. She had tried her best to figure out a connection between the characters in the story with the Huga ring, but she couldn't solve a puzzle if she didn't have all of the pieces. It was just all too much for a 12-year-old Jenin, who also had to focus on maintaining her training and completing missions. If she was ever going to solve this puzzle, she needed help. Same time. This train of thought was shared with her father as he sat face to face with Shikaku Nara. The head of intelligence could not help but be surprised by the requested meeting. It wasn't every day that a Hyuga hierarch admitted that they needed help. While the prospect was certain to be troublesome, it had definitely proved interesting. I'm sure your council would object to me aiding you in this, he muttered as he cast a lazy eye over the symbols and hieroglyphs. That's why I have neglected to inform them of our meeting. I can no longer pretend to act as if the Hyuga can solve this on our own. Generations have tried and gotten nowhere. The council has deadlocked. They seek progression, yet are unable to accept change. Shikaka nodded as he scrolled through the pages of the journals, his eyes absorbing the information off of the page. I'll certainly take a crack at it. I have a cousin who works in the cryptology department. He's extremely passionate about this sort of thing. To be honest, if it weren't for pressure from his father, he'd probably be an archaeologist. Is it alright if I bring him in on this? If you believe that he will provide substantial help towards your progress, then by all means. After a few moments of silence, Shikaku looked Hayashi in the eyes. How is Hinata-sama responding to all of this? Hayashi closed his eyes. Originally, not well. An incident like that would be traumatic for any child. It took a lot of coercion to get her to return to the bottom floor. However, she has lately been going down there more and more. Do you think she has made a breakthrough? I don't know. Honestly. Hayashi paused as he activated his Byakugan. The sight of the veins made Shikaku tense, as the Hyuga patriarch made sure that they were alone. This is strictly to be kept between you and me. Do you understand? Shikaku frowned but nodded. I've begun to notice something rather, odd. This was the head of the Hyuga clan. A clan renowned for its elegance, precision, and intellect. Odd was a very interesting choice of words. Odd how? He asked as he narrowed his eyes. There have been moments when. I have noticed large segments of time missing in my memory after talking with Hinata. To be honest, I didn't even realize it until one of my maids told me that I had been sitting in my office for two hours after a talk with her. It happens whenever she approaches me about something specific, but I can never seem to be able to remember what we discussed. Even when I have approached her about the topic, the same thing seems to happen. Shikaka's mind was racing. 
This was very concerning to hear from the head of one of Kanoha's most prevalent clans. He was very careful with his next choice of words. No offense Hayashi-sama, but, are you certain that your daughter isn't placing you in a genjutsu? Absolutely. She may have the chakra control for a decent genjutsu user, but she has never been taught any outside of the ones taught at the academy. In any case, I made certain to activate my Byakugan active on one occasion before speaking with her, and it was still active after I finished. Besides, she isn't the type to keep big secrets. She is far too kind for her own good. Shikako closed his eyes as his mind began to run through possibilities. She may not be the cause, but she is definitely the link. He rolled around an idea in his head. She may not be the one directly doing it, he said slowly. Seeing the frown on Hayashi's face he continued. From what you've told me about this monument of yours, this goes beyond the normal clan's secrecy bowl. Whatever Hinata-sama has gotten herself involved in, its discovery is certain to have a permanent effect on how the clan is seen and structured. This puts her in a position of extreme leverage. Someone may be trying to utilize this. Hinata-sama claimed to see a figure during her event in the library. While there obviously wasn't a ghost, there is a serious possibility there was another person in the room with her. Hayashi's eyes narrowed. Are you suggesting that this individual is the cause for my gaps in memory? What I'm suggesting is that there is a possibility of another party involved in this. For now, keep your eyes open for any shady activity within the clan. Especially keep a close eye on the council. They would be the only ones with clearance to that level. He began packing the supplies Hayashi had given him into a storage seal and shook Hayashi's hand. Thank you for looking into this for me. I am very grateful. Don't mention it. Besides, I still owe your wife for a mission during the war. Before I go, I'd suggest having another talk with Hinata. If she really has made a breakthrough, she will need as much help as she can get. Try writing a letter to her beforehand in case you find yourself subjected to whatever is going on. With that, Shikaku left Hayashi's office. As he headed for the front gate, he was surprised to run into the very topic of his last conversation. Well good morning Hinata-sama, he said as he gave the girl a small bow. Oh, Narasama. She said as she deeply bowed to the Jounin commander, I had no idea you were here. He chuckled as he stared at the girl. I had to attend to some business with your father regarding a personal project. I take it you are heading out to meet your team. Yes, sir. Well then. The Nara estate is in the same direction as the training grounds. Would you mind if I accompanied you? No, sir. Not at all, she replied with a smile. With that, the two headed out of the gates and began walking towards the west side of the village. How is Shikamaru? Is he adjusting to his new team? The girl inquired. Shikaku sighed as he ran a hand over his hair. The boy is even lazier than I had been at his age, but I can already tell he is going to be twice as sharp as I am. Concerning his teammates, he has been close with Chuji and Ino for years. At this point, it's like throwing three siblings together on a team. Hinata giggled as she pictured Ino standing over the two boys. She could clearly see her barking orders as the two boys groaned and complained. Speaking of teams, I'm very curious about yours, Shikako said as he glanced down at the girl. Really? Why is that? She asked. Your team is a special one. I don't know if you have any knowledge about the history of Team 7, but it's worth looking into. Every member who has been placed on that team has gone on to leave a permanent mark on the history of our village. This surprised Hinata. She had never thought about the previous incarnations of her team. Could you name someone I would be familiar with? So you haven't told her yet Hayashi, Shikaka thought. Shaking his head, he continued, well, this was about three iterations back, but the team seven of old used to be lead by Sandame when he taught the legendary Sanin. Hinata's white eyes were wide in shock. The Hokage had seemed to place her on a team whose legacy included the likes of the Sanin. He saw that kind of potential in her. And what did that say about her sensei? She had known he was skilled, but to that extent? I hear the team is now made up of yourself, the last Uchiha, and that troublesome brat who painted our clan deer's horns bright orange, Shikaku said with a clear look of irritation. Hinata had to bite her tongue to contain a giggle. She had completely forgotten about that incident. Shikamaru had been angry with Naruto for a week after that. Mostly because he had been the one forced to help clean it up. Well, Uchiha-san is very reserved and doesn't like to talk to the rest of us very often. He is incredibly talented and certainly lives up the reputation of his clan. 
His taijutsu is precise and he is very skilled in ninjutsu. However, he seems to carry a heavy burden upon his shoulders. I don't know what is causing him that pain, but we are hoping he will open up to us soon. Shikaka nodded, storing that for later. And what about the Uzumaki? As much as that incident bugged me, I can respect the brat for actually managing to sneak onto our property without being found. From what I hear, he's quite the fuinjutsu expert. Hinata nodded and beamed. Yes sir. Naruto Kuen has proven to be very adept at the art ceiling. While his taijutsu certainly needs a little work, I'm certain he'll be able to fix it. His speed is incredible. I have never seen anyone our age move so fast. Shikaku looked down at her with one eye. Is he using any sort of weight training? It's old-fashioned, but I've seen the results they can accomplish, he said as a vision of green spandex burst into his mind. No sir. I don't believe so. He might be receiving help from someone, but he hasn't told us yet. Although I don't know when he'd have the time. If he is not spending time on missions, he is always off in the woods reading and experimenting with new seals. Shikaku opened an eye and gazed down at her. Now how would you know what he is doing in his private time? She tried to prevent the crimson hue from spreading across her face. Was she really that easy to read? And in front of a clan leader no less. She knew this was Shikamaru's father, but still. Shikaku chuckled as the two continued their walk in awkward silence, well awkward for the embarrassed girl anyway. As they neared the west gates, it was time for them to part ways. I hope you and your team have a productive day Hinata-sama. Thank you Narasama. And I wish you success on whatever project you and my father are working on, Hinata replied with a bow. As she turned to leave, she stopped as older man called out, Hinata-sama, a moment. She turned around to stare at the Nara hierarch. Gone was the jovial expression he had worn on their walkover. He was staring at her with a serious expression that she had only seen copied on Shikamaru's face once or twice. It is never a bad idea to look for help from others, especially when you are in over your head. Keeping secrets will only add to your stress and make things more difficult for you. If you have a problem stopping you from telling someone, take a step back and find a way around it. With that, he turned and left the white-eyed girl shocked and speechless as she stood under the arch of the gate. He knew. Present. To say she was shocked would be an understatement. There was only one way he could possibly know about her issue. It surprised her that her father was so dedicated to this problem that he would reveal such important secrets of the clan to an outsider. Could the monument be the project that Narasama had been referring to? In any case, he was right. Being unable to share any information about the scroll was starting to take a toll on her. She almost completely avoided contact with her father in case he thought she was going crazy. It was also time to start reaching out to others for help. She would renew her efforts to reach out to her father. Maybe it was time to try a simple solution. If he something was preventing him from seeing the story in scroll, then maybe he would see it on a different one. She made one final strike before raising her hands over her head and brought them down in the ending position. Thank you Narasama. She turned around to see Sasuke staring intently at her face. He turned away quickly after they made eye contact. She was about to speak, when a cloud of smoke erupted on the bridge, revealing the form of Kakashi. You're late Baka-sensei. Naruto shouted. Kakashi bopped him on the head. Mind your manners, Naruto. Good news team. There will be no training today. We have received a special mission from the Hokage just for us. It will be a nice change of pace to get out of the village for a while. All of his genin perked up with this and stared at him with wide eyes. Yada! The blonde yelled as he bounced up and down. He grabbed Hinata's hands and started spinning in a circle. We got a C rank. We got a C rank. The blonde chanted as Hinata fought tooth and nail to stay conscious. I'm sorry to say it Naruto, but it is not a C rank mission, Kakashi chuckled as he watched the pair's antics. Naruto instantly deflated and face planted on the ground. Sasuke didn't seem too pleased either. Hinata wobbled in place as she tried to regain her bearings. The mission is still a D rank, Kakashi said, which caused the two boys to groan, it's for a lumber business less than a day's travel away from the village. But we're going out of the village. Doesn't that mean it's a C rank? What if we get jumped by bandits? While most missions outside of the village are generally C rank or above, that is not the case due to how close the outpost is from the village. Regarding any bandits, no bandit in their right mind would try anything so close to the village. We have scouting teams sweeping the area constantly, 
so no groups of bandits could ever set up camp along the path. Sorry to disappoint you, Naruto, Kakashi said with an ice smile. Naruto pouted and grumbled as Hinata reached out and patted his shoulder. Sasuke pushed off the bridge and faced Kakashi. So why is this mission so special? Kakashi turned to him and pulled out the mission scroll. The Hokage personally asked us to take care of this job for one certain reason. Him, he said as he pointed the scroll at the blonde. Me? Naruto exclaimed in shock. Him. Sasuke echoed his surprise. Indeed. A fire broke out in the workers' quarters two nights ago. While many of the workers were injured in the fire, thankfully no one was killed. The owner of the lumberyard has a very important order for a wealthy client in the village, and, sadly, the client isn't a very patient person, so the order needs to be shipped out right away. He has asked us to help him with loading the lumber into the wagons and escorting it back to the village. He and the Hokage are old friends, so when he reached out, the old man gladly offered him a cheap D-rank mission with the perfect man for the job. What makes me so perfect? Naruto asked as he wrinkled up his face. Simple. Your shadow clones and gravity seals. With your help, loading the carts will be much faster as you can replace the workers who were injured and reduce the weight of the wood for everyone. Naruto stared at Kakashi before saying, Hell, I can do you one better than that Kakashi-sensei. Hmm, why don't I just seal the lumber away in a storage seal? That way it is easier to transport and it would reduce the amount of time necessary for loading and travel. Kakashi rubbed his chin as he considered the idea. That's not entirely out of the question. We would have to run it by the owner before we tried it. He turned his attention back to his other students. All right team, since time is of the essence, we are moving out today. It is going to be about an 8 hour hike from here to the town, so we should arrive around 7 pm if we leave on time. Pack for an overnight mission and we'll meet at the front gates in 2 hours. Don't be late. With that, he disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Naruto looked excited. He rarely got to go outside of the village, and any chance to show off his fuinjutsu skills was all right with him. He stormed off towards his apartment shouting his goodbyes to his teammates as he ran off. This left the two clan heirs alone as they took a more leisurely pace back towards the village. Are you excited for the mission Sasuke-kun? Hinata asked trying to make small talk. Ichin. I'm not too thrilled by it, but it will at least be a nice change of pace, and that was all the boy said on the matter. They continued walking in silence for several minutes, until Sasuke surprised Hinata by asking, are you also irritated by Kakashi's lax teaching method? She rolled the question around in her head and chose her words carefully when she replied. While I can agree with Kakashi-sensei's attitude towards the importance of teamwork, I can admit that I would also like something a little more challenging. While I am sure he is taking things at his own rate, it can be frustrating at times. Her answer seemed to satisfy him. Good. When we come back from this mission, I want you and Naruto to back me up when I confront him. What do you mean? I'm tired of not learning anything new. I want to learn some actually skills that don't revolve around teamwork. Working together is fine, but we aren't always going to be facing enemies together. When we get back, I am going to make him change up our training schedule. Hinata paused before she asked, and what if he says no? Sasuke frowned as the gates came into view. Then I'll just have to find someone else who is willing to teach me. You have your family to help you and the dobe has his stupid books. I am not going to waste my time anymore. The resentment in his voice startled the Hyuga heiress. I don't believe it will come to that. I think Kakashi-sensei will listen to us if we present our case to him. Besides, we are a team. Whatever we do from now on, we do together. Sasuke sent her a look that she didn't quite recognize before he curtly said goodbye and headed off towards the Uchiha district. As she headed back towards the Hyuga compound, her thoughts drifted back to the scroll that plagued her free time and a headache started to form. A mission out of the village would certainly do good for everyone. Chapter 10, A Dying Breed Hinata was always one to arrive early. She had her own policy, always leave 30 minutes before a scheduled time. Maybe she'd get there a little early but it was always better to be early than late. So she was more than surprised when she found Kakashi waiting for her at the entrance of the village. You're here early, she said as she walked up to the man. You make it sound like this is a uncommon thing, Kakashi said with an eye smile. Hinata only shot him a raised eyebrow and he chuckled. Now, now. We are on the clock. I'm never late when we are on a mission. How punctual I am when we're off the clock is my business. 
I don't think Sasuke-kun and Naruto-kun would like it if they heard you say that Kakashi-sensei, she reprimanded. Probably not. Which is why it's just going to be our little secret, Hinata-chan, he said as he ruffled her navy hair affectionately. She tried to look a little agitated by the gesture, but couldn't muster up the anger to do it. The result ended up looking like something an amused pout. They stood there and conversed for ten minutes before Sasuke arrived. He had the same surprised look as Hinata upon seeing Kakashi. Instead of commenting on it, he walked up to the wall of the village and rested in the shade. Of course, it was two minutes before the scheduled time before Naruto burst onto the scene. I'm not late am I? He panted as he tried to regain his breath. Nope, just in time, Kakashi drawled, I assume you left your bag on purpose. The boy nodded as he reached into his kanai pouch and pulled out a little scroll. All sealed up and ready to go sensei. He said with a smile. Kakashi nodded and turned to address the group. Okay team. Like I said before, this should take us about 8 hours to get there. While this mission isn't exactly going to be life-threatening, still act as if we were in a real scenario. Consider it training for the real thing. All three lined up and Naruto gave the man a mock salute. What are your orders, sensei? Kakashi sighed and continued, Sasuke and Hinata. When we arrive, I want you to drop off your stuff in your accommodations and begin patrolling the area. While there is little threat from enemy Nin, there is a chance of one of the men getting a little greedy in the wake of the confusion. Just keep an eye on things, while the manager and I discuss some details for tomorrow. What about me sensei? Naruto butted in. I was getting to that. You are going to join me for your proposal to the manager. I think it would be best if there was a practical demonstration to ease the man into the idea. Naruto's eyes lit up. He loved getting to show off his few injutsu prowess, even if it was something simple. It was almost too quick to see, but Kakashi noticed Sasuke shooting the boy a short glare. Oh, was the little Uchiha prodigy getting a little jealous? Now wasn't that entertaining? Kakashi smiled as an idea popped into his head. Well, if we are going to treat this like a real mission, why start when we get there? This drew confused looks from his genin. Oh, they were just so precious and innocent. Let's have a little fun and treat this like an escort mission. Ha! Huh? Naruto intelligibly said, I don't get it. Who's the escort? You. Kakashi grinned. As the boy sputtered, a tiny grin broke out on Sasuke's face. What's wrong Dobe? It makes perfect sense. We have to protect the most fragile of the group. What did you say, bastard? Naruto yelled. Hinata held an arm in front of him and tried to hold him back from lunging at the black-haired boy. Naruto, although Sasuke was a little rude when he said it, it does make sense. Hinata-chan. You too. He sulked off on the ground as dark lines appeared above his head. You think I'm fragile? Her eyes widened and she quickly shook her head. And no, 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 naruto Kuen. You misunderstood. I, I meant that you are key for making this mission a success, so it makes sense that you are the valued person. Kakashi chuckled as he watched the exchange. Alright. If you're done pouting Naruto, then let's move out. Sasuke, you take point, while Hinata and I will be alongside Naruto. The mission was so far a success. The trio of figures watched as their escort interacted with the manager of the lumberyard. His blonde hair gleamed as he amiably chatted with the manager about how they could reduce the amount of time necessary for transport due to their tragic accident. He only glanced in their direction once, and the dim gleam of their forehead protectors in the evening light reassured him that they were still there. As time went on, he noticed one figure's detach itself from the rest of the group and head off deeper into the woods. Probably to go on patrol. Things were certainly going to start heating up soon if what the manager had said was true, but this was what he prepared for. It would be unprofessional for him to lose his composure at the first sign of trouble. After all, you don't spend two years of your life preparing to infiltrate Kanoha only to lose your cool at the first sign of trouble. The IWA Jounin wanted to sigh due to his comrade's vexing behavior. The man was a ninja for crying out loud. He was way too fidgety than the Jounin felt comfortable with, especially this close to Kanoha. The Jounin could barely understand that such a kid's reasoning for including him on this mission. The Chunin was rash, impatient, and thought with his heart rather than his head. He was too much of a loose cannon for this delicate operation. The Jounin preferred the Chunin's other teammate for this mission, at least he could act professional. That was why he had sent the man off to prepare for the incoming team from Kanoha. Damn that cursed drunkard who had caused the fire in the barracks. Because of him, 
Their operation, which had taken months of paperwork and preparation, was at risk. Their mole was posing as a carpenter under contract for the labor yard. It had taken months to forge the appropriate paperwork for him to get into Kanoha, but now it could possibly be undone just because of an uncontrollable accident. Murphy's Law really was a bitch. Now, Kanoha was sending out a team to help the manager and that complicated things. The Jounin's team was sent to ensure that the spy slipped by the Fire Nation borders undisturbed, and provide cover for an escape route in the event something went wrong before he got inside the village. Their close proximity to the spy could alert the group from Kanoha that something was wrong, causing them to investigate further. He was broken out of his thoughts as the other Chunin returned. Daiki san, the team from Kanoha is almost here. The Jounin frowned. Did they catch even a glimpse of you? Q shook his head. No, I'm certain, but you don't have to worry too much. Like we hoped, it's just a team of Jenin. Daiki felt a weight lift off his chest. Perfect. Now the only thing they had to worry about was the Jenin team's Jounin. Depending on his or her ability, they may not have to alter their plans. Perfect. I can't wait to see the trash Kanoha sent. This'll be a breeze. The other Chunin confidently smirked. Daiki frowned. Takara, go check on the traps set along our escape route. What? But why? I want to see the Kanoha scum up close. He argued. The Jounin fixed him a dark stare. Because I ordered you to. Now move it. The Chunin grumbled as he darted off. Q offered the Jounin an apologetic smile. I apologize for my friend's rude behavior Daiki-san. The Jounin rubbed his forehead. He sounds too much like that upstart Yuda. How the hell did that insubordinate hothead become a Chunin? Takara is one of my best friends, but I will be one of the first to say that he wasn't quite ready to be promoted to Chunin. Yuda-sama and other members of the council put pressure on the Tsuchikaj in order to speed him along. They needed him to pass the requirement in order to activate certain clan restoration laws. Even if he is mentally not ready for the rank, he makes up for it in his ability. Did the Tsuchikic tell you why he was chosen for this mission? Something about covering us if we need to escape, but I don't see what the hell could be so special about that hothead. He's one of the last of his family line. His family had a special Kekai Genkai, which made their clan especially hard to kill, but almost all of them died during the last Shinobi War. He's a little overzealous when it comes to Kanoha, since one team discovered a weakness in their jutsu and exploited it. After spreading the information across their ranks, the clan's numbers greatly diminished. The Tsuchikic sent me to keep him in check because I'm the only one he'll calm down enough to listen to. Daiki was not one to argue against the decisions of his Kage. If the man thought Kyu could handle the Chunin on this important mission, then he would let him. Still, his attitude towards Kanoha reflects more of Yuta's mindset than I would like. His hate-filled speeches and propaganda are doing more bad for the village's moral, than good. Kyu nodded. I agree. Did you hear that he wanted the Tsuchikaj to pardon the traitor Daidara as well? Daiki rounded on him, that's absurd. After all of the damage he left in his wake out of the village, Q looked grim, he believed he phrased it as being able to forgive the rebellious stage of a young artist. Honestly, I think he just wants to gather up as many people he can who would side with him over the Tsuchikaj. Daiki shot him a look, do you think he would try anything? He shook his head. Not anytime soon. He does not have enough followers for that, but I won't deny that I think that may be his ultimate intention. That is part of the reason why the Tsuchikage has assigned me to watch over Takara. He wants me to try to shake those feelings of hate out of his system and ensure his loyalty. He paused and turned his attention towards the road. I apologize Daiki-san, I believe we are going to have to cut this conversation short. The team should be arriving in a few minutes. They waited in silence for several minutes before the silhouettes of Kanoha's team became visible in the dark. Q did not get a chance to look at the group up close before, so now he really began studying the group. He did not recognize the Jounin, so he turned his attention to the Jenin. The first to become visible had a mob of blonde hair and a booming voice. There was something familiar about the boy but he couldn't place it, so he turned his attention to the other two. The blonde was chatting along with a young girl with dark hair, who he was surprised to recognize as a Hyuga. Not just any Hyuga, but a main family member. He was even more surprised when the boy in front passed and he recognized the iconic fan shape on his back. An Uchiha. The last loyal Uchiha to Kanoha. A different train of thought went through the Jounin's mind as he instantly recognized the Jounin from the bingo book. 
That was Kakashi Hataki of the Sharingan. Of course they couldn't have been blessed with a lower level Jounin. Instead, they were faced with arguably the strongest Jounin Kanoha had. Thankfully, the man's attention was held by a small book and his students were too distracted conversing amongst themselves to notice the duo watching them. They would have remained undiscovered, if their other teammate had not chosen this exact moment to loudly return. Immediately, the Jounin tackled Takara and held him behind a tree. The Chunin struggled furiously as the Jounin tried to keep him quiet. All he could do was pray as he tried to silence the impatient Chunin within his grasp. After several minutes, Q appeared by their side. It is clear. They have passed. Daiki finally released Takara, who began gasping for air. What the hell was that for? Shut up you idiot. You almost got us caught. He turned his attention back to Q. Did they notice us after I dived for Takara? The Jenin did not notice, but the Jounin did glance in our direction. He seemed to stare right at where you were hiding. If he noticed, he didn't act on it. Shit. He said, as he ran a hand through his hair. Hataki would be suspicious now. He would now be keeping an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. Their spy was good and was trained to fool even Kanoha's ANBU, but even so, he was not prepared for someone with Kakashi's experience. Especially, if they had to stay in a close proximity with him all the way back to the village. There's more, I don't know if you noticed, but they had the Hyuga and Uchiha heirs with them too. What? Takara gasped, screw this infiltration mission. Let's just abduct them now. The heirs of the two most powerful dojutsu lines are worth way more than protecting the spy. The Jounin closed his eyes as he thought. He really wanted to consider it. The opportunity to nab two valuable heirs to Kanoha was almost too good to pass up. However, the more he thought about it, the less enchanted he became with the idea. If they were to attempt to abduct the two, he was certain a confrontation with Hataki would be unavoidable. If they managed to get away, Kanoha would surely start asking questions as to why they were in their borders to begin with, which would put their spy at risk. And this was assuming they managed to get away. Right now, they were in the heart of fire country. It would take them days of travel to reach the border. It was already going to be challenging to leave undetected as originally planned. They would be even slower with the added weight, making it easy for Hunter Neem to catch up. Plus the border patrol. As good of an opportunity as it was, there were too many factors for them to fail. As much as I hate to say it, we are going to have to pass on this opportunity. We would likely fail in our endeavor and potentially put our spy at risk. Takara was about to object, but was silenced when Daiki raised his hand. Non-negotiable. Now, let's move on to see what we can do to make sure this mission is still a success. First, we need to push back in case that Hyuga activates her Byakugan. Next, their Jounin is going to be on the lookout for anything suspicious now. We have to find a way to draw his attention away from our informant. Here is what we are going to do. We're finally here. The blonde shouted as the complex came into view. The complex was mostly barren with a few clusters of buildings off to one side. On the opposite side of the complex was the actual lumberyard. The ground was covered in dirt and pine dust from the acres of trees that were torn down. Hinata and Sasuke also let out a sigh of relief as their eyes wandered the new environment. Kakashi's attention may have seemed glued to his book, but he was instead scanning the tree line around the complex. He was sure he had seen something earlier, and it was making him uneasy. Any friendly hunternine or patrolling officer would have at least clarified his identity through hand signals. The whole situation made him uncomfortable, and he had long ago learned to listen to his gut. Change of plans guys, he said as he turned their attention back to him. Hinata, Sasuke, I know I told you to look around, but I've changed my mind. We are all going to go meet with the manager, before we hit the hay. You guys deserve a break for not complaining through the whole trip. Hinata seemed grateful, and Sasuke seemed like he didn't care. Naruto was jumping up and down with excitement as they headed towards the administrative building. There was no need to worry them until he was sure it was something. It could just as easily been an animal that caught his attention, but he wanted to ensure it was nothing. To say that Naruto's performance for the manager had gone well would be an understatement. He had been captivated by the boy's demonstration and Kakashi could see the glimmer in his eye as the new possibilities this presented swam through his head. He had instantly agreed to the boy's proposition and was very interested to learn more about the sealing techniques. Unfortunately for him, Kakashi decided to end their conversation as he noticed his other two charges growing drowsy. 
The blonde and the manager had been talking for over an hour and he decided to cut their conversation short. They decided to set camp next to the storage facility for the lumber. After another hour, the three genin were sound asleep as Kakashi slowly exited his tent. He created a Kage Bunshin to stay with the group, before heading outside of their circle of tents. He paused to make sure Naruto's proximity seals were in still place before he dashed off towards the road. At his current speed, it took him little time to return to the spot they had passed earlier. When he arrived, he bit his thumb and made forehand signs before slamming his hand into the ground. After a cloud of smoke dissipated, a tiny brown pug sat in front of him. Kakashi, I thought you and your little squirts were out on an easy mission close to the village? The dog said in a gruff voice. We still are on our mission. However, how easy it will remain will be decided if you find anything in the next few minutes, Kakashi replied seriously. Pakan nodded his head and followed the man into the trees. He came to a stop a short distance away from the road and noticed a bush with heavily bent twigs. He knelt down and studied it as he waved Pakan over. See if you can get a scent off of this. The dog began sniffing at the bush, before turning to the man and said, Don't notice anything out of the ordinary. Kakashi nodded. Go look around the area, and report back if you find anything. As the dog walked away with his nose in the dirt, Kakashi scanned his eyes around the area. He was sure he had seen something right here. Even if it had been just an animal, there should have been a scent left over. While some might have said he was being paranoid, the ANBU in him just wouldn't let it slide. Kakashi, up here, Pakan called. Kakashi jumped up to a branch not far away and landed next to Pakan. Find anything? No, but that is exactly what the problem is. He pointed his nose to where the branch connected with the tree. Right here. I smell nothing. I mean, no smell from the bark or leaves. Nothing. I think we both know what that means. He did know what this meant. Many Hunternines and ANBU agents used a particular musk to hide their scent during high-profile stealth missions. It was as close to perfect as you were going to get. It completely masked the scent of whoever applied it, allowing the user to even trick the noses of the famed Inazuka. However, it did have one flaw. It worked a little too well. The musk was so heavy that it tended to linger for hours at a time. While some might have argued this was a good thing, it created its own problem. If a person lingered long enough, the musk would spread out and encompass the area around them. This left its own kind of trail, for it left behind a vacuum of air devoid of any scent. Kakashi frowned. Something was very wrong. Whoever had been here did not want their presence known. Thanks Pakin. I may need to call you again in the next day or two, so be ready on standby. When you return, ask the Hokage if he has any patrols going through this sector. No problem, the dog nodded before asking, and just when are you going to introduce us to your new students? Bull is very excited to meet them. In spite of the situation, Kakashi chuckled. I'll make sure to have them meet you all very soon. You guys may not like Sasuke, but I'm certain you're going to love Hinata. She'll probably spoil you rotten. Pakan waved his tail at the idea before disappearing in a cloud of smoke. Kakashi stood up and gazed around the forest. It was much too quiet for his liking. Someone was in the area that did not want to be found. Kakashi lifted off as he began searching for more clues. After four hours of searching to no avail, he finally quit and returned to camp. His arrival had caused an uproar from the blonde, who drearily charged out of his tent after being woken up by his proximity seals. The Jounin just waved him off by saying he had to go to the bathroom, causing the blonde and his two teammates to angrily stare at him as they returned to their tents. As all three went back to sleep, Kakashi summoned more clones to keep watch. Let them get their sleep. Tomorrow, they would need their energy. They were all going to be busy tomorrow. That's it for part 2. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.